Hi, this is Jim Montague, Executive Editor of Control Magazine and ControlGlobal.com, and this is the latest in our Control Amplified podcast series. In these recordings, we talk with expert sources about process control and automation topics, and, and just try to get beyond our you know, print and online coverage to really explore some of the underlying issues impacting users, system integrators, suppliers, and other folks and organizations in these industries. For our seventh podcast, we're talking to Dennis Brandel, Principal Consultant at BRNL Consulting Incorporated and co-chair of the Open Process Automation Forum's Standards Working Group, and also he's chair of the, its Technical Architecture Subcommittee. In these roles, he's one of several dozen experts trying to achieve the forum's vision of developing a truly plug-and-play process control system. Uh, Likewise, he was also one of many contributors to Control's March cover article, updating OPAF's efforts, and, you know, that was a tremendous help as well, and so we thought it would be good to get an audio version of this going in addition. Uh, Dennis, uh, sorry for the usual preamble, and and thanks for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to talk about this. Okay. Uh, first off, you know, for, for, for a lot of people who are coming at this for the first time, you know, what are the nuts and bolts of the Open Process Automation Initiative, and, and what is it trying to do? Sure, yeah. Um, nuts and bolts of it, pretty straightforward. The uh, concept here is to talk about opening up what classically has been a relatively closed market, which is the DCS market. And we're doing that through the Open Group. If you're not familiar with the Open Group, uh, the Open Group is a organization that's a password, that catchphrase is basically making standards work. So they don't necessarily develop standards, but they take those standards and then promote them and push them. Uh, so they've worked on ones that you may know, such as POSIX, which is the interface standard for operating systems. TOGAF, which is a standard for enterprise architectures, and FACE, uh, the future uh, airborne capability environment, which is being used in airplanes uh, around the world, essentially to give you plug-and-play capability there. So what we're trying to do with the Open Process Automation Forum is bring in some plug-and-play openness into the DCS marketplace to provide to basically move it forward from where it was in the 80s where the architectures were originally developed to where it can be today with the brand new capabilities that we have inside electronics and inside software uh, inside networking and we're going to make all those uh, available we're going to make those hopefully uh, uh, create a market for uh, a lot of different products and a lot of different capabilities Right, and, and back in the 80s and 90s and even today, there's just a tremendous amount of, you know, proprietary protocols and, and technologies and stuff, and their, their interoperability was not possible. And, and so, you know, OPA and OPAF are trying to get beyond that. To You know, I think it's been described to me as, you know, being like your stereo. You know, you can just plug in the speaker cables, and that's what we're trying to have the process control systems get to, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, traditionally, the DCS systems, the control systems, even some of the PLC systems have been closed. So if you want to have some of them work together, it's an expensive and a time-consuming process, and it's really, you end up with fragile systems. They don't work very well together because everything seems to be custom-made. We want to get rid of that, right? We want to make it like your USB you know, that you plug into your computer and everything seems to work together. You don't have to do any software. You don't have to do any configuration. Yeah. All right. So so then just to get in a little bit of history, how did this come about? Uh, can you summarize the basic, uh, um, you know, events leading up to what's going on with, you know, ExxonMobil and Lockheed and, and OPAF's efforts? Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, there had been a lot of work over, over the past decades, essentially, as people were looking at uh, different control system architectures and environments and saying, okay, you know, how, how can we take advantage of some of these? Uh, what happened at Exxon is that they, uh, they had, they still have, a lot of very old DCS systems because it's very expensive to replace a DCS system inside a refinery. So they've got TDC 2000s and TDC 3000s running. Um, the issue you have there is that these things are well past their maintenance time. Uh, we, we had a saying, if you can't buy the spare parts on eBay, then it's definitely obsolete. And I think that's the situation they're in. So they started a project to look at what are they going to do? Uh, 
several projects, as a matter of fact. One of those projects was a research project to say, okay, if you started from scratch, if you don't look at your history, um, how would you design a system today? <clears throat> as a result of that effort, uh, there were a couple of white papers that were written by ExxonMobil. Uh, they talked about uh, the requirements for the system, and they talked about how you could address it. And then uh, Exxon realized that this was bigger than them, that it was going to take a whole industry to look at some of these solutions. So they went to the open group to start that work to simply say, okay, let's see if we can take these concepts and ideas that came out of this research project and make them real. And that's what the Open Process Automation Forum is. Now, uh, simultaneous to that, um, ExxonMobil worked with Lockheed Martin to develop a proof of concept to make sure that these concepts would actually work in real life, in real applications. And that's what they did with Lockheed Martin. So they, we were able to, uh, in the Open Process Automation Forum, look at it and say, okay, these concepts, we know they're going to work. We've got a lot of work to do to make them work, but we know that it will work. We know that from an architecture standpoint, things are going to work together and play together, and we'll get the interoperability and the portability that we hope we can get. And, and then, you know, just to bring everyone up to the present, uh, the, the first version of the Open Process Automation Standard, uh, which is O-PAS, uh, was you know just announced this past February with five parts and uh, it'd probably be good to let folks know you know what they all cover. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The first release, um, it, it, it's not a real high bar to cross. The whole concept of this was to get interoperability to make sure that people could build devices uh, that are going to end up being the devices in the DCS that will actually work together. Uh, but it's also, as I say, it, it's, it's to set the uh, the foundation for the next level of uh, functionality that we're trying to define. Uh, so that foundation includes part one uh, of the standard, which is a technical architecture. Now, I want to make it clear, what we're defining is not a system architecture, but what we're actually defining are interfaces. We're not saying how people should accomplish the tasks. We are simply saying that if you want to have device A to talk to device B or software A talk to software B. Uh, these are the interfaces that you will use uh, to do that communication. Now, a lot of that is, uh, is based today on the OPC UA model, but the newer ones are, are also based on other uh, standards that are out there. Part two of, uh, I mean, yes, part two of version one uh, really deals with security because we recognize that if we don't design security in at the beginning, uh, it's impossible to plug it in later. So we're working closely with people who are on the ISA 99 committee and the 64223 uh, IEC standard to define the minimum security requirements that it would take to build a system because we want this thing to be secure out of the box and we want it to be able to be upgraded and uh, as new threats show up. Uh, part three of uh, version one is basically it's a summary of the profiles. The profiles uh, define the functionality that a vendor would provide to you. So, uh, for example, <clears throat> we have a profile that talks about how you perform system management, and we've got two different options of how you do that. Uh, likewise, we've got a couple options on the OPC uh, work. So part three is, is kind of a summary. Uh, part four of version one is dealing with the OPC UA, or we call it the, the OPAS communications framework. And what it defines is the functionality for interoperability. You know, one of the issues uh, about OPC UA is it is extremely flexible. So sometimes getting these things to work together, particularly when you have to worry about security and security requirements, as well as some of the options as associated with OPC UA. Sometimes it's hard to get those things to work together. <clears throat> so part four defines the profiles that says, build your, if your system supports these features, these functions, then it should play together right away. Part five of version one deals with system management. Now, uh, imagine a system that's out there, and it's made up of thousands or tens of thousands of very smart, intelligent little DCNs, distributed control nodes, that are all communicating, that are all executing the your, your control functions in a distributed manner 
Well, you need to manage those thousands to tens of thousands of devices. So we've selected the standard Redfish, uh, which is more on the IT side of it, that gives you the capability of saying, okay, I need to find out, is this device running? You know, what's some of the statistics on it, you know, some of the information on it, like is it running hot? Is, it, is, is the temperature too high? Does it have a fan? Is the fan working? Those sort of things uh, that you can use to look at all these devices from all these different vendors in one environment. So we have a couple profiles for that as well. Uh, anybody who's familiar in the, with server farms probably has some familiarity with the Redfish and how those would be managed. So think of a, a OPAS system as a server farm with tens of thousands of, or thousands of very small servers out there distributed out through the field or distributed through your control systems, and you need to manage those. So those are the five parts that came out in uh, version one in February. Man, thanks. That's a great summary, uh, and, and that'll really clear things up for people. But, you know, getting a – and I don't want to get too deep into the weeds, and there's lots of weeds. Um, you know, the, the OPAS uh, architecture is based on, you know, a little bit of specialized lingo and, and, you know, new names for things that are pretty familiar. So. Could you just let folks know, you know, what is a distributed control node and, you know, the real-time open connectivity network? Because, you know, DCN and OCN get thrown around a lot, but, you know, what are they? How do they work? And, and yeah. what are some of the examples folks might know of what those are? Sure. Yeah, uh, DCN, uh, it was the uh, an ac acronym we came up with to talk about uh, the distribution of uh, control into small devices. Um, I, when, as we were developing these, I always would hold up a cell phone and I said, a DCN, think of it like a cell phone, except it probably doesn't have anywhere near as much memory since my cell phone has a 30, 64 gigabytes in it. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't have a screen, but you know, it's got the computing power, it's got a multi-core processor, it's got network capabilities, it's got all this. Now, what we want to do is take that and uh, the sort of concept, the electronics and others that it takes to, to build that thing, and marry it with the fact that we need to bring in I.O. from signals, so we need signal processing, and we want to run these distributed control algorithms. So if you're familiar with a DCS, DCS is used to start out where you would build a function block diagram, and some function blocks would go in one device and some in another device because the devices were old. This was the 80s. This was the 70s. They couldn't, the processors couldn't do much. Today, you can run an entire plant on a processor the size of, uh, the, the, the size of a brick, but right. you may not want to, right? So a DCN is the idea to go back to some of the distrib distributed capabilities so that if you have failures, the failure is very limited, and the key there is the DCN can be upgraded. So if you can pull a DCN out and put it with its next generation, your system over time evolves. You don't have to worry about a big bang update. Now, to but, make but I mean, a, a PLC could be a DCN, right? It, it could be, and the primary difference, as from a hardware standpoint, it is. From a software standpoint, PLCs tend to stand alone. They don't really participate easily in distributed control algorithms. You've got to program a lot of that in. Uh, our concept is that you don't, you're not really programming it because it's all running on the um, the o OCF, the OPAS uh, communications framework. Right. Uh, that's, as I said, that's running OPC UA. Um, best way to think of that? It's Ethernet through the entire facility. It's the Ethernet that connects the DCNs together. Right. Uh, and then we're using the protocols that are in the OPC UA to do that communication and to make it transparent to your program. So I don't have to program in a data transfer from one DCN to, the, to another. Uh, all I need to do is reference the piece of data, and the underlying system will take care of getting it for you. Cool. And, and the OCN is, is, you know, like a, you know, I wouldn't say a field, but but it's like an Ethernet. You yeah, know, field it's an Ethernet. Think of it as an Ethernet, right? It's, it's an Ethernet communications uh, backbone. Um, yeah. You know, it used to be when you built a uh, a DCS, your backbone. If you were lucky, you you had you know a ten megabit or megabyte backbone plane communicating between all the pieces. You know. Today, that's a slow network. <laughs> so, right. you know, we have definitely changed our capabilities over the past uh, 15 years, 20 years, to such a point that um, the concept of networks are slow just doesn't apply anymore. Networks are fast. Networks are backbones in a lot of uh, systems today. Exactly. 
Um, so in in the three stories I've done about OPA and and its developers, you know, Exxon, Mobil, Lockheed, and the other forum members, are you know, they always stress that they don't want to tell suppliers what to put in their components. You know, they just want to define the interfacing between them. And, and so, you know, how does this provide the interoperability that you know OPAF is seeking? Yeah. You know, and and isn't it just to be a little bit of a devil's advocate, isn't it also kind of an indirect way of saying, hey, we really need you to build this? <laughs> um, it, it, actually, it's more like an indirect way of saying we really hope you're going to build this. Um, yeah, we are uh, very specifically not talking about functionality as we're defining the OPAS standards. We're really only talking about the interfaces. Now, these can be software interfaces, so we're going to actually have software interfaces that eventually say, okay, you have to accept a file of this format in order to have your configuration. Um, it's also software and communications interface to say you need to support this model of uh, the OPC UA, whether that's the publish subscribe or the client server model. And also we'll have a physical um, interface standard. And the physical interface standard probably is getting to more of where that interoperability piece is. Um, uh, you know, it would be some size of a box or a rectangle of some kind uh, with some connections on it, some standard connections, some standard side of type of connectors and power uh, going into it. Um, that's probably a little bit further in the future, uh, not necessarily coming out in the next version, but the version after that. But that's where we're really going to help try and get this interoperability, um, interchangeability, and portability, which are really our goals. Cool. Um, can, can you also, now we talked a little bit earlier about the kind of parallel effort that uh, you know Exxon had going before it, the, the larger you know, OPAF effort uh, took off, and, and they're still working on that. Can, can you discuss the the Exxon and Lockheed, the proof of concept, the test bed, and the pilot projects that you know that are paralleling OPAF's standards effort? Well, I can, yeah, and I can tell you about what what they talked what they talk about publicly about those sort of things, which is really basically all the information that I've got on it. You know, but publicly, what uh, what Exxon Mobil did was they. Uh, contracted with Lockheed Martin, and Lockheed Martin then went out to uh, several of the suppliers that are out there that are actually members of OPATH and said, okay, we want to do a proof of concept. Uh, we want to use some of the standards that uh, we talked about in there. And, you know, some of those standards, obviously, was the OPC UA standard. Another was an IEC 61499 uh, set of tools, which, if you're not familiar with, is a distributed function block standard. It's an uh, so uh, there are a couple standards out there for function blocks in the IEC world. This just happens to be one of them that handles distribution and it's event-based. So they use those that software. Uh, they also did some some interesting thing with with hardware that they talked about. Uh, Raspberry Pi is probably uh, the most popular proof of concept and prototyping uh, piece of hardware that's out there. If you're not familiar with the Raspberry Pi, it's Thirty, forty dollars delivered to your house, and it's got more processing power than we actually used to launch. No, I was going to say launch to the moon. It's got more processing power than we used to launch the space shuttle programs. Um, but they they used some of those as some of the hardware. Intel had also ha provided one of their uh, small little computer systems that that were integrated in, and then a couple of the other vendors also supplied some hardware to it. So it was to say. Take what you've got, see if we can layer the software on top of it and make these things all work together. Uh, that's what they did, uh, primarily to see whether or not the, the concept that we're in, was in IEC 1499 distributed function blocks would actually work, part to see if you can get the communications throughput uh, across Ethernet talking to these devices to actually run control loops. Uh, an interesting statement that they made at, at the ARC conference was, yeah, we were told we had to slow down our control loops from, uh, you know, 10 milliseconds to 20. <laughs> Those of us in the process of wow. industry gone like, uh, okay, that's, yeah, that's going to be fast enough. <laughs> yeah, that's more than sufficient do. for, uh, you know, yeah, for, for most for process, process applications. Control. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, so and that's, the, the, that's what they did. Well, and the pilot projects, they've, these are physical plants that Exxon and Lockheed are, are operating to, to test some of these The concepts. first one was a test bed. 
Yeah, so the, a second right. one that they've talked about a little bit, it actually is a pilot facility that they use to, to test out uh, processes, and, you know, verify chemical processes and, and th those sort of things and control strategies. Yeah, so it's actually going to be running on what we would probably call a, a real plant. <laughs> you know, it's not going to be using, at this point in time, it's not going to be using uh, certified products because we don't have all the specs out and, and we don't have right. the certification things in place. But it will be running something real. Yeah. Well, that, that'll be something else we can cover as, as we go along. It's just nice, you know, to hear about something physical happening as opposed to stuff just happening in the, <laughs> you know, in the in the uh, ether, as they say. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is not just vaporware and marketware and slideware. No, the exactly, things are actually exactly. working. Exactly. Yeah. Although they certainly are taking over in most realms that we cover, and it's a little psychologically taxing for, you know, let alone covering it, but for the people who were trying to use it, I'm sure. Um, in, in addition to that, I, I think that we, there was a non-PlugFest event that was scheduled in June at yeah. ISA's headquarters in, uh, uh, in North Carolina, and there was like 20 or 30 suppliers. They were going to test products to see if they could comply with OPAS version 1. Um, I, I didn't even follow up, uh, so I just was wondering, did it happen, and can you yes. convey any news about it? Yeah, yes, it did happen. We had 15 different companies that were participating, and they brought 27 different, uh, I'm not going to call them products, I'm going to call them proof of types, right. prototypes sort of uh, things, um, <clears throat> to see if their systems would support or, or would match what we wrote in the part in the version one of the standard to make sure that the things would interoperate. So we were checking the system management capabilities of these devices, as well as the OPC UA communications capability of these devices. Um, several vendors came in with stuff that was almost working. Most of them left, I think maybe all, all of them left with stuff that, yes, it did interoperate, it did work. Um, it, the idea of this was to get the developers together, they, not you know, I, I don't want to say we didn't invite managers, but they were kindly discouraged to attend. We wanted to get the real developers, developers in there. I walked into the meeting room, and there's there every all the programmers are over their computers and laptops, looking. You know, very quiet place because that's how they were doing their work. Uh, but they all got it working together, uh, and the real goal of it was not necessarily to make sure that that the products would work. It was to make sure that the spec was right, that we didn't write any holes and we didn't make any mistakes when we wrote the specifications that existed in the OPC UA and in the Redfish uh, implementations or the, uh, the specs we had for implementations. So as a result of that, uh, they're making a couple changes. We found a couple bugs and a couple places where they just have to do some minor tweaks to the standard itself. But from that standpoint, it was very successful um, uh, interoperability um, fest that we have. Sometimes we call them plug fests, and um, their plan is to have another one later once these once the uh, vendors start developing real products versus their proof of concepts. Right, right, and that's a standard thing to do in many you know fields of endeavor is to have you know these kind of events. Although they were talking about this one as a non plug fest plug fest, and yeah, I think yeah, it's a, yeah, because it had fest, to be called that, do, you know. Yeah, they had to call it that. When we do a real plug fest, what we'll, we'll actually do is we'll open it up to to anybody who wants to come in, um, because the, at that point in time, the the, the first version of the standards will be publicly available, and because uh, uh, right now it's the preliminary version, the, the, the official version is coming out in, in a couple months here. Um, yeah. So we'll make the plug fest open to everybody. But right now, for this interoperability, it was it was really just the OPAF members, because they're really the only ones that could actually look at the documents before they get officially right. released cool well well the, you know and here's the shortest and final question so far you know what, what's what's next for for OPEF and the standard coming up sure yeah and I hope I'm not going to steal anybody's thunder when I say about this but the, the next goal the next thing that we're doing with version 2 uh, which is scheduled for, for early uh, 2020 is to have portable configurations so uh, you can imagine that you could have a vendor tool that you use to configure the system, and configuring the system includes the definitions of your function block diagrams or your IEC 1131 uh, diagrams and the, and the associated, I'm going to call it code because I was an application programmer for control systems, 
but that's the configuration that we want to make portable so what you can use one vendor's tool to create it and download those configurations into different vendors pieces of hardware and uh, or you could take that configuration from one vendor's tool and put it into another vendor's tool you know maybe you have one tool that says I I'm configuring alarms and then another tool that says I'm configuring function blocks and a third tool that says I'm configuring my IO list and they would all share that same information with a common format so it's portable configurations is what our goal is what that's going to give us quite honestly is the, is the capability of, of, of taking a system and saying we can actually control a real system with all of these standards and we can do it across different vendors different vendor hardware and different vendor software it's a big exciting first step we Man, had to do version it. one to lay the foundation now we're layering on top of that and giving us this portable configuration capability yeah, like putting the icing on the cake man this is it's, well, it's I'm gonna call it the second layer we still have some ice oh, okay on. all right all right well you know the the whipped cream and the strawberries yeah, in the second exactly. layer we're right? not at that point yet but we're, we'll, yeah. we'll get there but there's a really a palpable sense of excitement of like man this might really work you know and and, and uh, you know you can sense from the the folks involved how the potential advantages are you know unbelievably helpful yeah. and, and oh uh, absolutely and I mean it changes the market I think a lot of people re recognize that a lot of the vendors look recognize that and, and others but uh, we also look at it and we believe that quite honestly the the concept of open markets and open systems has changed you know other markets quite openly I mean you, you can see this in telephones as to what it changed in that market sure you can see it in other industries and we recognize the fact that's going to occur in our industry now the question is we can let it happen or we can help it to happen we can exactly. help drive it exactly and that's why people are excited because they're looking at this thing we got capabilities we'd never even dreamed of five years ago ten years ago just never thought we could do it now we can do it it's going to make a big change but we know at this point in time we know we can do it and that's the important thing that's why people are getting excited terrific well well listen Dennis that was a great update on OPA and OPAF and OPAS and I know a lot of people, myself included, were curious about the forum's activities. So uh, thanks for cluing us in today. I'm glad to, glad to uh, provide some help and tell you all the exciting things that we're doing. All right. We'll, we'll check in, probably do another one when there's even more updates to let folks know about. Um, this has been another Control Amplified podcast. I'm Jim Montague. Thanks for listening. Oh, and uh, please remember, listeners, if you're out there, to... Uh, Control Amplified podcasts are available on most podcasting apps, such as the iTunes Store and Google Play, and it's also at Control Magazine's YouTube channel uh, podcast, and you can also listen at uh, controlglobal.com, of course, anytime. All right, thanks, everybody, and uh, we'll check in later. Mm -hmm.